Do you have a crew next to you or? Okay. So we'll start the uh, rotator cuff today. So we've already talked about impingement. Now I'd like to talk about the pathogenesis of uh, rotator cuff disease, which is really the tendinopathy, which is a, uh, the causative factor of rotator cuff tears. And then we'll talk about how we look at tendon changes. So what typically happens is the uh, tendons and ligaments of the body are predominantly type 1 collagen, which are long triple helixes of, of uh, uh, atoms like this. And you can see they bind the water uh, in the in the middle here uh, of the uh, of the collagen bundles, and what we're obviously looking at with hydrogen MR uh, are the hydrogen atoms within the bound water and unbound water. So you start out with microscopic tears of the collagen fibers. The body then has a repair mechanism to try to fix them. Uh, the repair isn't perfect all the time, especially if you have ongoing injury during the time of the repair. This leads to granulation tissue and disruption, permanent disruption of the type 1 fibers, uh, and that leads to weakening and me mechanical integrity of the tendon, which will eventually lead to tendon rupture. And uh, so this is what the normal triple helix uh, looks like with bound water. When you start getting these uh, tears in, uh, in it, what happens is this exposes areas of the macromolecule where the water can, can come in and bind. And if it binds to peripheral components like this, it has much greater degrees of freedom than if it's bound internally very strongly, like should occur in the, the normal molecule. Because of that, you've got more water, it moves more, therefore its T2 time is going to be prolonged. Uh, and, and you'll start getting gray signal intensity on short TE images because uh, you get signal on long on short TE images of the normal tendon. The water is too heavily bound. Its T1 time is too short, and therefore we don't get a signal from it. But as they become more mobile, the T1 time increases, uh, and we start getting gray signal on short TE images, but with a mild degenerative change. Uh, uh, with these small microscopic tears, it's still black on the long T2 images. But as you get more and more fiber disruption, more and more granulation tissue, and more and more loosely bound water, uh, it becomes brighter and brighter. And there's a situation where the water is browned loose enough where you the T1 time isn't too short so that you can actually see it, but it's still bound enough so that... Uh, you don't lose signal intensity on the short TE images, so it becomes brighter on the short TE images, and then you, with severe tendinosis, you start seeing gray signal intensity on the T2-weighted images, and then you can get actual microscopic tears within the collagen fibers where you get free water that pools in the collagen. This can be variable in T1, but often short, and it uh, tends to be now bright on the T2-weighted images, and we call that severe tendinosis, or sometimes uh, low-grade or high-grade partial tears, and then it can have a complete tear. So rotator cuff disease, it starts with repetitive trauma, and most of this trauma are stretching injuries. Uh, the, the leads to the biochemical breakdown we just talked about, repair mechanism, which leads to tendinosis, more and more disease and, and injury, leads to partial tears, full thickness tears. And then with the healing process, when you have partial tears, uh, you can develop calcific tendinitis uh, in the granulation tissue of the healing uh, tendon. So rotator cuff disease, as we said before, uh, there were a lot of theories in the past. So some of them felt that this, this kind of process occurred, but it was impingement from the uh, bones of the uh, acromion and a AC joint, which is proven pretty much not to be the case. <clears throat> uh, but one thing, this was a cadaver study uh, published in 1991, where they looked at uh, tendons and cadavers, a large number of tendons, and what they found in cadavers is that all torn tendons shows significant histological evidence of tendinosis. So they claim they didn't see any 
tears even in younger patient or younger uh, cadavers uh, with high velocity injuries uh, where there was a tear of the tendon without significant underlying histologic tendinosis. So the tendinosis comes first and the tear comes second. So rotator cuff tears, uh, what we know from cadaver studies is that they're very common in individuals. Uh, in fact, a third of cadavers of all ages will have partial or full thickness tears. And then what the cadaver study shows that as opposed to Neer's theory, that the disease primarily comes from impingement from the acromium and acromioclavicular joint, it turns out that articular side is much more common for partial tears than bursal side. And that then, uh, they argued, uh, doesn't fit well with the currently accepted pathophysiology at that particular time. Uh, we also know that overhead athletes uh, without significant bony impingement uh, can have 40% partial tears or full thickness tears. And these are primarily overhead throwing athletes. And in fact, there are a number of pitchers in Major League Baseball who have partial or full thickness rotator cuff tears, but continue to function in their sport. So it's, uh, it's overuse. And uh, my guess is, and it's mostly a guess, is that when people get to middle age or older age, what happens is during the 20s and 30s, people tend not to exercise a lot. They tend to be involved in building their whatever business they're in or their profession that they're in. Uh, <clears throat> and and they you start getting atrophy of the collagen fibers and, and some muscle atrophy. Uh, but then later in the 40s and 50s, people will have episodic exercise and uh, the body doesn't like episodic exercise very much because if you have weakened muscles and tendons and you go and overstress them, uh, you'll develop microscopic tears. Whereas if you continue to uh, keep the the tissue in good shape, uh, you're, you're less likely to develop those kind of tears. So it's common then in the 60s and 70-year-olds for relatively minor activity to, to produce tears uh, because the the tissues will, will atrophy. And so as it is in the lumbar spine, one of the ways to try to maintain uh, the tissue integrity is really by, by exercise. And there are a lot of studies that have shown that you decrease uh, muscle pains, and you decrease risk for uh, soft tissue and bone injuries if uh, people can continue to exercise at a regular rate and uh, maintain the integrity of the muscles. And another thing that sig significantly improves is one of the major causes, as you all know, of injuries in older individuals is falling. And falling uh, significantly is dependent upon muscle strength. Uh, people who have strong muscles, if they get off balance, they can recover without falling uh, and uh, recover without tearing a muscle at the same time. Uh, whereas if you develop a lot of muscle atrophy then uh, and tendon atrophy, if you start to, tell, to fall, you try to catch yourself, you tear the, the muscle or the tendon, you continue to fall and then break a bone and so forth, and you get the muscle tears. So exercise is known to become more and more important to uh, for health as people age. You guys... And now is a better time for you guys to worry about it than if you wait till you get my age. Uh, so uh, what does it look like? These are the old images where we had T1-weighted images and T2-weighted images. But here you can see the nice dark tendon. There's a little bit of magic angle artifact on T short TE images, right where the tendon fibers uh, are at the proper angle for uh, a magic angle to occur. You don't really get that on the T2-weighted images because they're a longer TE. So uh, supraspinatus, you guys have seen this. Early tendinosis, as you all know, increased signal intensity on the T1. In this case, we're seeing increased signal intensity on the T2 as well. So that's a moderate degree of tendinosis. Uh, and here we can see a little bit of irregularity of the inferior surface. Here's an arthrogram that shows that a little bit better. Uh, some people will call this a low-grade articular-sided partial tear. Uh, some people will just call this tendinosis, uh, but it's probably best described as a low-grade partial tear. 
see. So uh, another example, this is a T1, T2, and PD fat set. When I started doing PD fat set images, here notice that on the T1 and T2, on the T1 we can see a little bit of tendinosis. The T2 looks nice and normal. The PD fat set shows that there's actually some interstitial disease here of the tendon, uh, which we see a little bit less well on the T1, but we see it there, and the tendinosis within the more proximal tendon here, the supraspinatus. Okay, Tayson, what do you think about this case? All right, so looks like there is supraspinatus tendinosis. Okay, so here's the T2. Now we typically do T2 and PD fat set images. So we can see that there's some increased signal intensity on the T2. As you know, this is a, not that sensitive for tendinosis, so that's a, at least moderate tendinosis when you see a lot of fluid like this. I tend to call it more uh, high tendinosis or partial tearing when I see actually more fluid signal intensity within the tendon. And then we see a lot of signal intensity on the PD fat set, which is much more sensitive for tendinopathy. Okay, what else did you see? Uh, looks like the, uh, there's some downsloping of the uh, acromion. Okay, so the little downsloping of the acromion which we talked a lot about uh, a few decades ago. Uh, I still mention it, though it's it's not really considered a significant risk factor anymore. And then and then what we can see is that there is either fluid or some sort of increased signal intensity within the subacromial subdeltoid bursa here on both of these. Yeah. Okay. And then this was called a full thickness tendon tear uh, when this was interpreted. Okay, now then we have a study on 10-8-2022. What do you see here? Uh, I see an intact uh, supraspinatus tendon. Okay. So, so now the tendon actually looks pretty dark and bright. We see a little bit of fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursus. That soft tissue thickening that we saw in the bursa before is now gone. Uh, yeah. So is that like a synovitis that resolved? Yeah. So this was a resolved bursitis. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, bursitis has been used a lot in the past, kind of uh, indiscriminately here. But here you can see that this really looks like it's thickened uh, tissues within the bursa or fluid within the bursa and uh, tendinosis, and we can see there's a lot of probably more acute tendinopathy within the tendon here because its margins are very indistinct with a lot of high signal intensity on the on the T2-weighted image. So this was after the patient had pain at this time, and there was a, a, a an, an injury involved in this particular case. And now we can see that this, over time, it was just rested, and the patient got better, and when they came back, we can see that the tendon, the, the tendon may be a little bit thin, but the edema we saw within the tendon has resolved and the bursitis has resolved. And, yeah. and I think this, the subacromial subdeltoid bursitis, I think in part can actually be due to traumatic problems with the, uh, with the acromion process. And I think that's probably what occurred in this particular case. When the patient rested it, uh, the inflammation resolved uh, and uh, the symptoms went away, and we can see the MR scan really shows a resolution of that with just a little bit of fluid left in the space. But the rotator cuff tendon is still intact. There was no full thickness tear. Okay, so here on the T2 image on the left, supraspinatus tendon these maybe there's some few tendon fibers going to the foot plate but there i think there's a tear that's retracting most of the tendon fibers um okay so uh, and this is a post-op remember uh okay you're right so there was a prior repair of this supraspinatus it's 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, it doesn't look like the tendons are going to where this, the suture anchors are. So I would, I'd be worried about a, a, a re-tear. You know, there is a lot of contrast in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa here. Right. So uh, whenever you look at tendons, I think it's very important to look at two locations. One is where you think the location of the main tendon is, which I think is right here. And the other is where the muscular tendinous junction is, which I think would be right in here. Here we can see the cone-shaped muscle coming down, and this is the, uh, uh, the, the tendon in this location. Now, the, the muscular tendinous junction should be around the 12 o'clock position in the normal shoulder, and the tendon obviously should be attached to the bone over here at the foot plate. In this particular case, what we see is about two centimeters of proximal retraction of the musculotendinous junction and about two centimeters of proximal retraction to this end of the tendon. Now, if this wasn't a surgical case, what I would call this would be a full thickness tear because you know that in order for the musculotendinous junction to retract this far, the tendon can't really be intact. If you had even partial part of the tendon intact, the musculotendinous junction wouldn't retract. Uh, uh, so then the question is, what is this? Well, what you can have is, if you have, if the disease is really uh, starts out as a tendinopathy, and you start getting tears and high-grade partial tears, what happens is the tendon and muscle start retracting because of muscle tears. Uh, the other part of the, the tendon, which is degenerated, uh, starts a healing process, but the muscle can continue to retract, and you can continue to have scar tissue, which uh, uh, stays in contact with the tendon and the bony insertion. And this is called scar in situ. Oh, one of the things that bothers me here is the anchors are in the wrong place. Uh, they're way too distal. And so uh, the, that that uh, uh, cuff was under probably considerable tension, and no wonder it tore. Probably didn't need anything uh, to cause it to to tear, uh, like a fall or anything. Yeah. Um, so so it, it, it's um, the lateral side of the greater tuberosity, and that that's just, just too far. Yeah, so uh, a bridge too far, uh, uh, like in a second world war. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, this had a, a, a procedure for the chromium, uh, the near procedure, and uh, that that looks pretty good. Um, and of course, the the fluid in the in the bursa is uh, probably causing a great deal of pain. Yeah. Now. Uh, this, if you had a double row technique, this would be okay position for the second row, but we have no proximal row here. If you have a single row technique, it really should be at the foot plate here. So as John was saying, uh, for a single row technique, this isn't the usually accepted placement of the suture anchors. Now, now in the case... We... For, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, John, but I think even in a double row... That's too far for the for the lateral or the distal row. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about the the techniques yeah, when I, we get I, to the surgical I, I, section. That's right. I just wanted to mention that because it it it, it looks like it's, it would have been a failure no matter what the patient did. So now, in order to could be com with complete confidence to say that this is a failure of the construct. The other thing you really need, which you never have, except for a few experimental cases that I'll show, would be an MR scan right after the surgery. Because in this patient, this patient looks pretty young. There looks like really good tissue here. So generally, when you repair this, you like to repair it anatomically. And therefore, the distal end of the tendon should be implanted in the bone in this location. 
And it's important that the bone and the tendon heal because just the sutures you put in will eventually fail. So the sutures are there only to keep the tendon in place to allow uh, native healing to occur between the bone and the tendon. Uh, and now, if, if you imagine um, that the way the sutures would be, if you look at the um, suture anchors, the, the, the sutures go way over the top of the um, foot plate, and uh, and they don't attach um, the the tendon to the foot plate. Right. So, so that that that's just not going to work. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to, lose my track. Uh, to attach that uh, tendon uh, and press it into the foot plate. Yeah. So in, in a case like this, where this was a uh, uh, suture anchor, uh, now, oh, I'm not, hold on, okay. Now, at the time of surgery, if it's an older individual where you, you check to see if you could bring the tendon over to, its anatomic location without a lot of strain on the on the tendon. And in older individuals, especially have a lot of fibrosis in the muscle, that may be difficult. And if you try to actually attach it when there if there's too much strain on it, uh, you, you will break either break down the the point where you put it in into the bone, or you'll get a secondary proximal tear called a type two tear within the tendon. So if it's a pretty large tear and you have too much strain if you put it in an anatomic location uh, people will often try to uh, put it back in a near anatomic location where it may be a little bit proximally retracted hoping you will get scarring down uh, which will tie it down without proximal retraction without secondary tears and when we go to the surgery i'll show some examples of these different things uh, so it could be that when they did the surgery, they left it in this location on purpose, but probably not in this particular case. It's a pretty young individual. So this is probably a situation where the, uh, the, uh, bone, the bone tendon attachment failed. The tendon started being retracted proximally, and you develop scar in situ along, uh, along the course there. Uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, this is really a, a failed surgery most of the time, unless this were an older person with a large uh, lesion. Uh, what's really important is the symptom, symptoms of the patient. Not all patients with supraspinatus tendon tears have a lot of symptoms. So especially in older individuals, which are a lot of our patients, uh, you don't necessarily have to, to fix everything. Uh, and there are a lot of theories as to what produces pain and what doesn't produce pain, and we, we'll talk about some of those later. So I think that's the distal end of the tendon. I think it's proximally retracted. The suture anchors are two peripherally located, and this patient was the single row technique. There's the uh, muscular tendonous junction. So this is really a full thickness tear with, of the construct with scar in situ. All right, so we have a 60-year-old with chronic pain, rule out cuff or labral tear. Uh, looks like there's at least moderate to severe tendinosis of that supraspinatus with some articular sided tearing. I'll say at least moderate grade. Okay, uh, so you would call this a partial, a moderate grade partial tear? Yes. Okay, so this is 10 for 2010. Okay. So cuff or no cuff. I uh, just want to point out that the muscular tendinous junction is probably retracted back to here. Okay. Uh, so that's, t and here, uh, if you notice here that there's no contrast in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Mm -hmm. So if it were a full thickness tear, you might expect contrast to go into there. Sure. Uh, if you look on the sagittal images, this really looks like a pretty significant tear here mm -hmm. on the sagittal images. And this tissue up here is very kind of irregular. And this patient, okay. Uh, so we described this as a, we couldn't exclude a full thickness tear, but, but it wasn't communicating. So the patient went to, went to surgery. 
And this is what the area looked like uh, from inside the joint space looking out. And uh, a little hard to orient you here. This is actually the end of the supraspinatus tendon. You can see that this is a full thickness tear, mm -hmm. full width tear in this particular case. This stuff back here is this stuff up here. And what we're seeing, that's the distal end of the tendon we're seeing here. Oops. This is the distal end of the tendon. This is all that scar tissue over the top. So that's the tear itself. That's all scar tissue back there. And then when they came from the bursal side, what you can see here is you don't, they, this, now they put the scope into the bursa. And what you see is that scar tissue with areas of calcification within it, but there's no tendon here. This is all scar tissue. So if you go back to the MR scan, this is all scar tissue here, scar in situ. That's the distal end of the tendon. And you can see the proximal retraction of the musculotendinous junction. So th this was... So this was treated uh, like a full tear. So what they did is actually uh, remove the scar tissue. So they took out the scar tissue here. Now you can see uh, through the, the, the joint space uh, uh, in the biceps tendon here. This is the, uh, uh, the distal end of the tendon itself. They then did a double row technique where they sutured it back down. And this is now tendon going to bone. Uh, and uh, at this point, it was uh, it ended up being watertight. So, uh, so it's it's I think it's very helpful to look at both the where you think the distal end of the tendon is and where the musculotendinous junction is. If you've got proximal retraction of the musculotendinous junction, you got to be dealing with a full thickness tear. And if there's other stuff there, it's probably scar in situ. Okay. Great. Forty-nine-year-old. This one may take us the rest of the lecture. No, no. <laughs> Forty-nine-year-old asymptomatic male. Okay. Um, so in 1998, I went into the scanner just to get some kind of images on on a baseline shoulder. This is the right shoulder. So what do you think here? So on the uh, sagittal and coronal views, it looks like there's increased signal within the supraspinatus. And then there, yeah. So, you know, you've got a lot of places and people will talk about the most common place where the tear is, the critical zone and so forth. But overwhelmingly in the 50 to 100,000 MR, the shoulders that I've seen. the, the well, Anybody at 49 is over the hill, you know, John. Definitely. No, no question. Uh, uh, the, the, the vast majority of rotator cuff tendons start at the anterior insertion of the supraspinatus and the superior insertion of the subscapularis that we'll talk about later. Uh, but this is the common location. And here, you know, this is actually a T1-weighted image. This, this is a PD fat sat image. And we can see it really looks like tendinosis, right? So I uh, have a little tendinosis there. And this individual was asymptomatic at that particular time. Uh, so that's tendinosis. Okay, well, fast forward nine years later. Nine years later, intermittent pain for four years after body surfing injury, severe pain for five months. Um, looks like there's uh, focal, now there's like focal fluid. Notice how much better quality the images were <laughs> in that nine years. So, there's, so at the, uh, at the supraspinatus uh, insertion, there's focal fluid. Um, looks like there's at least high-grade tear. Yeah. So, you know, you could say this is a high-grade partial tear. Uh, to me, this looks a little bit more like a full thickness tear with a little bit of scar in situ in there. Uh, and it's well, certainly was painful. So uh, here's the PD fat sat, where you don't really see that little scar in situ there. So this is 621.07. The sagittal image looked like this. Okay. So, yeah, you just... Same, uh, it was like full okay. thickness tear there. So, so it's a small, small full thickness tear. Okay, so we scheduled surgery. The surgeon called me up Sunday night. It was supposed to be for Monday morning, and said, "You know, why don't we try PT?" So I said, "That's fine with me. I just as soon not have surgery." So we then started physical therapy, uh, and two months after physical therapy, this is what it looked like. 
So two months after physical therapy, we're still seeing high-grade signal, but it looks like it's maybe developing a little bit more scar in situ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to me, it looked a little bit worse, uh, but it was almost asymptomatic at this point. Okay, so this is 8 2007 And, you know, it hurt a little bit at that time, but I continued the physical therapy. Then I went back four months later, and this is what it looked like. So it still looks like there's full thickness tear, and there's looks like there's some retract, maybe some retraction of the tendon. I think a little bit of retraction, but I think there's more scar in situ here okay. than there was before. And at that point, I was completely asymptomatic. And I was exercising in the gym uh, without really a problem, so that's no symptoms. Uh, now this is now this is two thousand seven. Now this is about uh, eight months later, and this is what it looked like. So, eight months later, it it almost looks like the tendon is <laughs> is reformed, but that I guess it's just more scar in situ that's forming. Yeah. So. So, you know, the edges are more sharply delaying. That they're not as irregular. And uh, sharp margins of structures in the musculoskeletal system is a good sign. That the fuzziness that we saw in some of those other cases, which are associated with symptoms, is kind of a bad sign and associated with symptoms. Probably has something to do with the inflammation and the tissues at that time. But again, at this point, uh, I was asymptomatic. And I was back to full exercise and overhead lifts and, and so forth. Uh, okay. So this so is... If, you're, if you did it overhead, then you're asking for trouble if you look at the chromial right. processes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess I was asking for trouble, but at that particular time, I didn't. The, the interesting thing about it is if I... Uh, and then this was uh, a number of months later, and again, I had no symptoms at this particular time. But if I stopped exercising for a couple of months, the pain would come back. I'd start exercising again, and the pain would go down. So there's a, there's a lot that I certainly don't know about the association between the anatomy and the pain. Still looks like there's a tear there on the sagittal images, but probably some scar in situ, which is kind of holding in place. So this kind of shows that cuff tears can stabilize, and that uh, uh, just like we talked about the knee with people who have moderate degenerative disease of the knee, they go out and run a marathon, and actually their symptoms in their MR gets better. It's crazy, but there's something that has to do with exercise that I never understood before, and I still don't understand it now, but it seems to be beneficial to the musculoskeletal system. Uh, in the body. We'll talk more about that when we talk about cartilage disease. Well, I have a tear in my left shoulder also, but and uh, I got it from uh, uh, doing chin-ups uh -huh. over, over, yep. over the door sill, and uh, I felt a pop. Ah, uh-oh. Yeah, right. Okay, so this is 2010. Let's fast forward a little over nine years, and let's uh, look at this study. Uh, we've we've banged on Glenn enough. Uh, Tayson, same patient. Uh, what do you think now? Nine uh, nine months later, uh, nine years later. Uh, can I see the uh, previous one? I'm sorry. What did you say? This, this is the same same individual. Uh, it looks like there's been some scar formation. Maybe that restored some function. Okay. All you guys know this fellow, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then unfortunately this patient stopped doing exercises for the last year and it became painful again for three months. So I wanted to do an MR scan before I to see whether I should start exercising again. And here we can see the abnormal signal intensity within that anterior tendon area. Uh, so this is on 12 7, 19. went back to doing exercises. Now this is uh, uh, three years later, and this was, uh, I developed uh, shoulder pain again 
after working out. Same tendon. What do you think now? Uh, I think there is a definitely a gap now where that uh, granulation tissue was. Yeah, and I think there's a little bit more proximal retraction of the musculotendinous junction. So I think this really is a full thickness tear uh, with retraction. Uh, wait, this, oh, actually, let me go back for a second. So at this time, I decided to have surgery, and then I, I decided not to. I started exercising again. The pain went away, so I, I canceled the surgery. But now I came back and uh, during COVID, and it uh, looks like it's a bigger tear now at this point. And it was, uh, it, the pain had come back, so I elected to have surgery. Uh, this, is, this is August of 2022. This is September of 2022. Here we can see the big gap in the tendon at this point. The mark fraying in irregularity of the lung head of the biceps tendon. <coughs> and there was also a tear of the superior insertion of the subscap. So this was a supraspinatus tear with what in the old days would have been called a hidden lesion, which was injury to the biceps and the superior insertion of the subscap, which we'll talk about in great detail uh, uh, later, either today or, or Thursday or Friday. Uh, uh, um, but here you can see a lot of biceps tendinopathy, which we could also see on the, uh, on the MR examination. So they went in and kind of cleaned up uh, the, the mass. I uh, did a double ankle repair. This is just what they put in the sutures before they were going to uh, tighten it down to the bone, roughened up the bone so you'd have a bleeding interface at the distal end of the tendon and do a double row technique. They did a single row for the superior subscap, and then they did an interarticular biceps tenodesis for the biceps tendon. This is after they tightened everything up of the supraspinatus tendon uh, post-repair. So here is uh, MR scan of the shoulder one day after the repair. So here we can see the area of the tear. Uh, still there's signal. We don't really see the black signal of the tendon coming all the way to the bone. And the musculotendinous junction is still a little bit medially, posi medially positioned. So they, they actually didn't pull the tendon back into the, what would be the anatomic position because they thought that that would over-tension the tendon. Uh, so they put it in here, hoping a double row technique would allow scar tissue to form uh, down in this particular area. Here we can see this is the peripheral uh, suture anchor line for the double row technique. Here's the proximal line. Then you try to put it down with, with uh, overlapping sutures to put uniform pressure between the tendon and the bone interface at this point, uh, and so you can maximize the area between the tendon and the bleeding bone uh, and trying to stabilize it to allow healing to occur there in as large of, a, of an area as possible to make it as strong as possible. That's the idea behind uh, the double ankle sutures. There are other sutures here for the subscap and the biceps tenodesis. And here's the sagittal image in the area of the tear. Notice it looks much smaller now after the uh, surgery was done. Here we can see here's the biceps tenodesis, where we can see the uh, biceps tendon attached here going into the bone. Uh, 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 there are four suture anchors for the supraspinatus uh, repair, two distally and two proximally. And then there's a, one over here for the superior subscap as well. So this is... Uh, the day after the surgery. And uh, this is not a fun surgery to have, as John can tell us from his patients. Here's this, the subscap suture anchor there and a lot of edema within the superior subscap. Okay, so this is 9-15-2022. I went back about three months later. Uh, this is what it looks like. And now we can see that there is some separation occurring here which didn't make me feel very good. And at this time, this was about three months out, it was still uh, quite a bit painful, though it was much better after the first six weeks uh, than at this particular time. So uh, that was the follow-up at that time. Uh, a lot of edema in here, but this is this is this subscap uh, location. And if you, this was 322, this is six months post-repair. Still see that there's a little bit of defect in the tendon here. 
the the suture anchors itself look like they're kind of in in intact. Uh, the uh, subscap uh, actually looked good, as did the the tenodesis uh, area there. At this time, uh, I was finally pretty asymptomatic and started uh, kind of low-grade exercises. Um, that particular time, and then, and then I followed this out. I'd probably like to do it again pretty soon here. Now it will be over a year uh, to see what it looks like. Uh, the The interesting thing about this that I found is. In retrospect, I think most of my pain was coming from the superior subscap and the biceps uh, 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 disease. Because if I think back when doing exercises, where my symptoms were worse were actually uh, exercises that strain the subscap and the biceps. And now those look like they've healed well. And... Uh, and I, I'm going back to really full full exercising now, and I don't have any pain with bench pressing or, or or curls anymore like I did for a few decades before. The supraspinatus tendon, my guess is when I go back, is still going to have a tear in it, but I'm really completely asymptomatic uh, right now. So I just give you an idea of trying to correlate what the MR findings are with patient symptoms uh, where we... A rare situation where we know both. I would not recommend overhead exercises. Okay. All right. I'm very cautious with those. Let's see. Uh, Tayson, what do you... Uh, wait. Tayson, you're... Let's see. I think it's your... Kelly. Okay. So, 60-year-old radiologist, shoulder pain and weakness. Um, I'm seeing increased signal... In the on the bursal surface of the supraspinatus tendon, uh, the mild tendinous junction. Just trying to see if that's retracted. Uh, oh, it's hard to tell. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look at it on other images, probably. But again, we see that same tear at the anterior insertion. Yeah. A really common location for tears. Okay. At this particular time, the patient claimed weakness. We called a tear. Uh, this is my physician. Uh, they refused um, surgery. And let's see, this is 42803. Uh, this is that same patient two and a half years later, and the patient was asymptomatic at this time. Mm -hmm. On the. I, I hope they're not saying that two and a half years of physical therapy did the treatment. I'm sorry. This is 2003. Should I get this out? But this is 2003. Uh, Medicine is expensive. It is. A, it, it is. But two and a half years of it. That's what they uh, said. Two to three hundred bucks every session. Uh, wow. Uh, that's... Yeah. I, you know, my guess is he probably had a fair amount right after, uh, right around the time, and then. And then had it very intermittently over most of that time period. I don't, don't. And then teach the patients to do the exercises. And then here is a three nine oh nine. At this time, I think he was pretty asymptomatic, but he came back. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, we're seeing some uh, fluid signal on the PD fat side in that region with some subdeltoid bursal fluid, but on the T2, it looks more filled in, maybe some scar, scar yeah. in you. So I think it's scarred in and healed, which is what I was hoping would happen to mine. Mm. But it did for a while. I delayed surgery for 10 years, but yeah. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, I think we have time. Well, let's talk about partial tears. So uh, uh, you can get acute muscle strains and tears, which are not very common, but uh, uh, they occur in, in this particular area. You can get tears at the musculotendinous junction, which again isn't common, but, but can occur. You can get tears in the tendon proper, which can be transverse, which are more common, uh, which again are 
not that common, but I'll show some examples. Uh, tendon proper longitudinal, which is really more of a degenerative lesion. And we'll see some of those, especially the infraspinatus tendon. And then there's the tendon insertion foot plate tears right at the bone tendon interface, which in my experience is a vast majority of the early tears that we see, as we said. You can grade partial tears. There's a Harvey Ullman grade. Uh, and if you're in measuring it, at surgery, and I think this is, came from open surgery at this particular time, grade one is less than three millimeters thick, uh, grade two is three to six, and grade three is greater than six. Generally now, uh, most of the literature uses low grade versus high grade. A low grade partial thickness tear involves less than 50% of the thickness. A high grade involves more than 50% of the uh, thickness. If the patients are symptomatic and it's a high grade tear, even though it's not full thickness tear, some of those patients may be repaired before they go on to some of the chronic diseases that we'll talk about later. There are some names for some partial tears. One is called a posta lesion from uh, Steve Snyder from the Valley here. Partial articular surface tendon avulsions. I'll show you what that is. And there's a paint tear, partial thickness articular surface intratendinous conway. This is an overhead athletes with intact foot plate. And this basically is a less common lesions where the bone tendon interface uh, is the same, but the tear occurs more proximally within the tendon itself, typically only in athletes, uh, because it's just an overuse, overstrain injury, whereas most normal human beings uh, don't do that. They wait to degenerative changes and get the foot plate tears. We have a 23-year-old baseball pitcher, a weakness for four months, no trauma except for baseball. Uh, looks like there's some atrophy of the supraspinatus. I think the tendon looks like it's intact. Okay. Yeah, it's and pretty. There you go. And then in some ways, notice how well developed the rest of his muscles are. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, we've seen this not uncommonly in Major League Baseball players where they'll get isolated rotator cuff tendon atrophy. We saw this, I think, in a player, one of the Angels players in one of our previous lectures that was uh, atrophy of the, I believe it was the uh, infraspinatus. Most of the time, it's an isolated atrophy of the, of the teres minor in this particular case. And uh, it's kind of a chronic lesion. It generally thought to have something to do with a nerve injury. Uh, with denervation of the of the muscle, but it's amazing how you can see these in very high level athletes. They said that, that, that this patient uh, was a pitcher and didn't have any trauma. That's that's a uh, that doesn't make sense. Pitching is trauma. He had pitching trauma, but no other trauma. Oh, okay. right, exactly. 31 year old male with pain after a weightlifting injury. See a sagittal fuse here. Um, Corona. Oh, sorry, Corona. Um, looks like the supraspinatus tendon looks like it's intact, um, but it looks like maybe a little tendinosis, but um, it looks like there's edema in the musculotendinous junction and mm -hmm. proximal tendon. Or possible muscle. So there's a sagittal image. It looks like, yeah, so there's there's quite a bit of edema within the muscle. So this is a muscle muscle strain. The vast majority of injuries we'll see will be the tendon. But in young people, the tendon's very strong, so it doesn't like to tear. Even though we see it occasionally in, in athletes, you tend never to see, or uh, I can't remember a case of a tendon tear in a young person who wasn't uh, overusing it, but here we can see a muscle strain. Tayson? All right, 16 year old male pitcher, and in two weeks will out label tear. Um, the labrum, at least on these two images, looks intact. Okay. Um, but there is some strain of the um, supraspinatus. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like a lot of edema here uh, in this particular patient, and especially on the PD fat sat images. And here we can see that edema on the sagittal images. And this was another muscle strain. In this particular case, I'm a little bit concerned that this may have abnormal anatomy where the musculotendinous junction may be a little bit distal and the muscle may extend into the outlet here, which might be partly put it at risk for developing an injury to the muscle. Okay. Is he a weight, weight lifter, John? Uh, so I know? think he was a uh, male uh, pitcher, so he, I'm sure he was a weightlifter, but he was primarily a baseball pitcher. Yeah, well, that, that, that muscle looks way too far. Yeah, too far distal. Distal, yes. Yeah. But, I mean, you see a lot more of these than me, but that just strikes me as yeah. way too far. Okay, so I think, I think we're posterior here. We see some signal in the infraspinatus muscle. So an infraspinatus muscle strain, possibly. Yeah, the increased signal there. Back here. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's an infraspinatus uh, muscle strain. Yep. All right, so we have two axial images. Uh, looks like there's a lot of edema in that infraspinatus as well. Think so? Yeah. And that was an acute tear. Yeah. Okay, Greg? A 38-year-old male with shoulder pain and limitations of motion after a lifting injury. Um, so it looks like we have coronal uh, views. It's like we are, are you posterior? Yeah. Um, so it's like there's quite a bit of increased uh, signal within the, uh, I guess, it's not really fluid signal. It's it's dark on the PD Good. fat set and bright this, on the... This is the, end, this is the teres minor muscle. The teres minor, so it's um, like, I guess like, a, is it fatty atrophy of the... And here we can see down here. Yeah. So yeah. So there on the uh, on the uh, sagittal, you can definitely see there's fatty atrophy the teres minor. So when you see this, one thing you have to look at uh, the, are the the neurovascular bundle and the axillary pouch, because uh, the teres minor muscle is mostly innervated by the axillary nerve, and therefore if you have a lesion in the ac in the axilla here or the quadrilateral space, that could lead to denervation of the uh, teres minor. Uh, I've seen a lot of isolated teres minors uh, atrophy like this, and I've the vast the vast majority, like ninety percent of ninety ninety five percent of them, there's no lesion. Maybe even ninety nine percent, there's no lesion in the quadrilateral space. But you have to look for it. Uh, so I'll show some examples where there is. Uh, so the question is, what causes this? It's typically an athlete. So my guess is that it's due to uh, either traumatic injury to the nerve or stretching of the nerve, or somewhere in the past they had a tear to the inferior labrum and got a paralabral cyst, which compressed it, causing denervation of the muscle. The cyst then went away over time, and but the muscle stayed atrophic. Uh, but... Uh, a lot of these, uh, I'm, not, I'm really not sure what the... Could, could be a nerve injury. Yeah, I think it's a nerve injury. How the nerve gets injured, I'm not entirely sure. And here's here's a more acute example of actually strip muscle strain uh, with edema in the teres minor muscle. And another example of a high-grade uh, partial tear of the teres minor muscle here uh, with a typical feathery appearance that you can see here. This would be a grade one lesion, but with fluid in it, that's really a grade two. So a high grade partial tear. Uh, Taysen. All right. 
Um, are we looking at the Terry's minor minor muscle, which looks uh, edematous, and is that the tendon that's not uh, in continuity with the attachment? Okay. Yeah, so there's excellent images. So what do you think is going on here? If there's a an involvement of the teres minor problem. Right. So this little bit of piece of bone that's pulled off. There's a teres minor muscle. So that was a bony avulsion of the teres minor tendon. That, that goes with the age. Yeah, right. So why don't we stop here today and we'll continue uh looking at Partial tears and then oh, uh, Thursday. We'll we'll go through the different kinds of tears of the uh, rotator cuff uh, on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you, John. Don't don't hurt your rotator cuff, John. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Thank you. See, mine mine was in forty nine. I'm eighty five, and I still. Uh, but I'm not doing any overhead exercises. Good for you. Good. Great. Never intend to. All right. Every time I raise my arm, I know I'm going to be having pain, and I do. So, Very anyway. good. Okay. Talk to you Thursday. Take care, buddy.